Okay, we're recording. Uh, good morning and welcome to the bi-weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. I'm Alan Sherman, Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Lab. Today, it's our honor to have PhD student Cyrus Bonyati speak about um, one of the chapters in his dissertation uh, about uh, metaphys metaphysical ontologies for consensus in um, distributed algorithms. Um, welcome, Cyrus. Thank you. And uh, hopefully my voice is not too bad. I'm getting over a bit of an allergy cold, so um, hopefully I don't get too much brain fog either. Um, I think I recognize some of the names here. Uh, if you've seen my presentations before, especially last semester, uh, I did talk at that point on meta metaphysics as well. Um, it's become a little bit of a theme for me, but hopefully not one that extends too much further than this topic right here. Um, and to that extent, some of this will be a recap and hopefully um, the refresher of the uh, exposure to the knowledge will ingrain it a little more. Um, I know it can be a hard concept at times. If you have any questions uh, at any time during my presentation, please put them in chat. If you have any snarky comments, I also welcome those. Um, I do appreciate uh, all the critique I can get at this time. Um, it's just so really a working idea. Uh, and if you feel fundamentally that part of what I'm presenting is flawed inherently in some way, I, I would certainly welcome you challenge me on that. Um, I'll try to leave time for that at the end or even in the middle, depending on the pace that I'm, I'm going through this presentation. Uh, see if I can use Chrome. Yeah, cool. So um, I've taken a bit from uh, uh, some notes at work, but also from Sherman to try to do a bit of a, a bottom line up front. If you suddenly tune out in the presentation and you can't uh, manage to bear anything after this slide, then at least I've gotten something through, um, which is uh, effectively the problem. Right? The problem is that consensus algorithms um, are a huge smorgasbord in distributed systems. Um, they have a wide variety of proofs and demonstrations of those proofs for what actually is novel in each algorithm. Um, and using uh, strong philosophical arguments, you can stratify those algorithms um, and the way in which they go about their reasoning into an organized fashion. Um, that's the claim I'm making. Uh, we'll, we'll see how well that holds up throughout the, the whole presentation. Um, we get about an hour for these presentations, but hopefully I can get you out after about 50 minutes. Um, I gauged about 10 minutes for some of these sections and 15 minutes for others, but they could go much quicker. Um, hopefully they don't. Hopefully you guys do have questions. I'm going to try to pause every once in a while to uh, give you guys a chance to ask for clarity on things. Um, but uh, I, I am teaching a, a little bit of a new idea to at least some of you today, I imagine. Um, so, revisiting the problem, the existing problem in distributed systems and, and um, what are the possible solutions we can actually apply to this, uh, to this space. Uh, fundamentally, uh, and I imagine a lot of you are familiar with distributed systems, but some of you may not be. Um, distributed systems is predominantly focused on with regard to distributed computing, um, which I provided a definition from Christian Kation's book, but also Wikipedia. But it's important to note that any time you have a series of autonomous systems working together uh, to either accomplish something or working in the same environment, like a, a, any peer-to-peer -peer protocol that suddenly involves more than just the than, uh, than two peers or potentially have unknown peers, um, you've stumbled into the, the world of distributed systems, but um, that is not necessarily just uh, uh, a... Um, field that is restricted to computer science, right? Distributed systems is any autonomous systems, but for the sake of this presentation, we're scoping to distributed computing, but keeping that abstract nature in mind um, can help explain why consensus algorithms can get really out of hand. Um, as a whole, um, one of the reasons it is in so many fields is to some degree distributed systems is a convergent evolution of a lot of different problems that you encounter in a lot of different fields. Um, I, I like the example of parsonization, which is the tendency for uh, many animals, especially those which uh, interact in high pressure environments, uh, to turn into crabs. I mean, that's a very common, uh, or, or high environmental hazard environments to turn into crabs. It's a, a commonly known phenomenon. It's not the only uh, convergent form, but I do think of uh, uh, distributed systems very much as uh, something that a lot of fields find their way stumbling into. 
Um, I have the timeline of, of when a lot of those fields did do that over the years. And this is not an explicit timeline, but it is a rough estimate of um, how frequently and, and how many different fields have found their way into the realm of distributed systems. And the, the uh, years I'm putting on there are citations to papers. Um, and I can pull them up, but the, there are specific papers that, that touch each, each of those times. Even within computer science, though, the fields that went into distributed systems from computer science, for example, robotics versus distributed computing, they look at the world of distributed systems in very different ways. Um, they oftentimes call themselves distributed systems, and they oftentimes um, enter into distributed systems through consensus uh, and the need for consensus, but they will approach consensus in very different ways. Um, consensus, of course, being the idea that autonomous systems need to work together to build a single result, right? Um, so a lot of these fields like metaphysics or sorry, like metaphysics or math did so in the 60s, um, kind of on the back of the biology movement into studying this. So you had biology looking at how bees make decisions or how wolf packs make decisions. And math, uh, the, the field of math started publishing papers on, on how we can use um, uh, operations research to build that decision making. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar, especially in the graduate level, with um, TMR, uh, triple modular redundancy. Um, that is almost distributed systems, but the, certainly the systems that come right after that are um, in the realm of distributed systems. Um, so if consensus is um, where a lot of uh, fields end up trampling into distributed systems, uh, fundamentally, it's a primitive of distributed systems. And, and if you look through the literature, the idea of consensus as a primitive of distributed systems is everywhere. Right? Um, you don't really have distributed systems much without having much consensus. Um, so I keep monitoring the chat, hoping that somebody will spring up with something and, and uh, nothing yet. So um, with having uh, distributed systems as a fundamental, or sorry, uh, with having uh, consensus as a fundamental of distributed systems, um, again, you may assume that it has some fundamental properties that it's proving, right? Um, a lot of the other fundamentals in distributed systems, like the primitives for links, for consistent channels, or reliable channels, or broadcasts, they tend to have something like what we see on this screen, where they have something like an API for events, um, they have some ability to invoke them, some indication, uh, so request is invocation, indication is output, um, and so, for example, with Byzantine consistent channels, um, you call the broadcast function and it produces a deliver function that says that, you know, the, the message was broadcasted. That's great. Um, with that, there are certain properties, right? Validity, no duplication, integrity, consistency. Um, similarly, in another primitive of uh, distributed systems, we can look at Byzantine reliable channels. And because they're both very clearly defined, we have similar indications and, and properties. Um, Consensus does not have this at all. <laughs> uh, consensus can be proven in a wide variety of ways um, and oftentimes has a wide variety of properties that it's proven to, um, depending on the year, depending on the era, depending on the originating field of the consensus algorithm. Um, everything from changing from looking at Bs in the 60s and, uh, through 80s to looking at, you know, um, file storage on networks in the 90s to cryptocurrencies in the 2000s and, and 2010s and even today, right, the, the rise, dip, and then rise again of cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's a lot of different people in a lot of different fields um, proposing uh, new ways to solve the same problem. Um, and it's asked, does consensus require all systems to agree on a set of values or just a subset of them? That in and of itself is a question that varies from field to field, right? Some fields, uh, require consensus to have the exact same system at all times, right? Typically we refer to those algorithms as uh, permissioned systems because the nature of those algorithms is that they tend to know who all the participants are in the uh, distributed system. So it requires all systems to agree on the values. And the ones that don't necessarily require it are oftentimes uh, in the category of permissionless systems because we don't know that all those systems are even in, this, in the, uh, all those autonomous systems are even part of the distributed system in the first place. Um, so even that question varies from consensus algorithm to consensus algorithm. Um, consistency, though, uh, between the way we show primitives can lead to things like universal composability, which I know is talked about a lot, and I hope I use the word right, um, in cryptography. Um, but most importantly, it reinforces against stochastic. Right? 
Um, I talked about how a lot of these different fields try to address the exact same problem. Well, they try to address the exact same problem in the exact same way year after year, time after time. Uh, and there are a lot of algorithms which propose that they are novel. Uh, there are certainly enough distributed systems conferences that all of them can make the clear argument that they're novel. Uh, but there's no way to necessarily even tell which part of their algorithm is novel to the part that they're improving upon, unless they expressly say it. And there's not a consistent way to go ahead and, and create that comparison. How bad is this? Um, in 2013, uh, 11 years ago now, um, I swear that that's yesterday when I started my PhD. I mean, I didn't start in 2013, but geez, this was a new paper. Um, James Mickens of Harvard published a paper called The Saddest Moment. If you haven't read it, I highly advise you do. It is hilarious, um, but he's openly mocking how much redundancy there is in this field. Um, and a lot of people in the field took this very seriously and said, yeah, this is a serious problem and we want to fix it. We know that it is a problem. Um, if you're tuning out for my voice, just read this transcript. Uh, it, it's what a consensus algorithm looked like, and it's, it's a, a pretty funny transcript. Uh, but this is a problem that has been known for over a decade, and people consistently want to and try to do things to address it. I'm going to skip, so go ahead and read the paper if you would like to read it in more detail, but it is definitely a good read. Um, there are a lot of ways people have tried to fix this. Um, a very common approach people take to this type of issue is to taxonomize existing literature, review it all, and declare a new standard, right? Um, as a lot of you, I imagine, are familiar with taxonomies uh, and the effects that they have on industries, um, I put the XKCD comic on the right. Of course, that's a solution that oftentimes uh, creates more problems than, than uh, solutions. Um, and so we'll get to your question. After this, I just wanted to let you know that I will be getting into it after I finish this. Um, a common approach that's coming up, especially in the last six to 12 months, is the application of AI and ML. Um, proofs are exhausting, and they are exhaustive. Uh, there are a lot of small little elements that they're using, and using natural language processing, a lot of industries have been trying to use AI ML to reduce some of the complexity in their proof structures and find a common emergent structure. Um, that may be something that works. I don't know. It's not the approach that we're taking in this work, certainly. Um, another one that was taken, I think the formal methods approach, the first instance of that language came out TLA, not TLA plus, um, from Leslie Lampore, um, also um, creator of LaTeX, um, to create a formal method to um, identify the properties that are desired and how they're actually proven in each algorithm. And so this was another attempt to show the novelty of algorithms and do something similar. Uh, and finally, a personal favorite that I, you see sometimes in places like MITRE, the attack framework, or um, sometimes the conferences will come out with a new standard. Um, you get a bunch of SMEs in a room and you gather them all and you say, you know, once and for all, we're going to create the standard. And it's going to be the new standard. That's what we prove everything to. And then a bunch of papers come out reproving to that standard and it's glorious. And it, it works for a while. Um, and as you, you call out, is this a, uh, unique to distributed consensus protocols? Um, it is not at all unique to distributed consensus protocols. Um, it is perhaps, um, for me, most infuriating in consensus protocols, um, but I do think maybe most pervasive, um, at least maybe not from a research perspective, but certainly from a, fine, from a funded research perspective, the most pervasive in consensus protocols. The reason I say that is because cryptocurrencies, as a lot of you guys know, is a uh, pretty large industry globally um, with a lot of ability to do some pretty illegal things, um, and it's well-funded. Uh, a lot of different people come out with a lot of different white papers for a new algorithm that they created to fix this one problem in this um, cryptocurrency, and now we're going to create a new cryptocurrency based on that. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with, with a lot of those aspects. Um, that's why I think it's perhaps more important in, in this area than a lot of other areas, um, but it is an inherent property, right? That you end up with a lot of convergent uh, research into one topic from a lot of different areas, and, and that topic takes time to explore. Um, I do think the stakes being a little higher, it's not really easy to gather a bunch of SMEs to publish a standard in consensus algorithms as opposed to a lot of other fields where maybe there aren't a lot of different language barriers and a lot of different um, internal incentives, both among the community to use the 
um, systems properly, but also among researchers to potentially obscure the novelty in the work they're doing or not doing. Um, why won't these standards work right? So we talked about these four different methods that are oftentimes used to create standards. Um, at the end of the day, these four don't do one key thing that I think uh, is necessary for adoptability of a standard in general. Um, they don't improve communicability, right? So to go back one more slide, creating a taxonomy, you may have one descriptor for that taxonomy, but if people aren't familiar with that taxonomy or they show up late to the game, uh, as I'm sure many of you guys may be aware, um, if you guys have read like MITRE TAC version two or three and not read the first one, um, that can be very overwhelming um, and it doesn't improve communicability. And that's the same issue with the last one. AIML, we oftentimes just obscure and we hope that the output that we get is complete. Um, that doesn't improve communicability and formal methods are very communicable in their output a lot of the time. But if you've ever tried to work in a formal methods language, the barrier to entry on using that can be very, very high. Uh, and that is an additional part of communicability that, that's lacking. So even when we do adopt any of these methods, which I think all four have been adopted at some point in this field, um, over time they fade and they're not able to really be brought back up. Uh, and the fundamental issue that goes on with that is we're not able to update the methods or teach to the methods in a reasonable fashion. Um, th this is also a common problem, uh, typically seen in um, network log parsing more than anywhere else. Um, and in that domain, this is oftentimes referred to as pollution by dilution. I don't know what to filter, gate pass, or improve upon because the rate at which I'm receiving information is higher than the rate at which I'm able to process it to make those decisions. Um, there are too many existing algorithms with too many existing proofs and too many people working on them as well to make sure that we have one template at any given time for all of them. So how has this been addressed in the past? Uh, it's certainly not a new problem. Um, we've had these types of issues for as long as we've been around as human beings. Um, this topic alone, meta metaphysics as an approach to handling this, goes back to uh, Plutonic days, right? Pluto, um, philosopher. Uh, the fundamental idea here is how do you know, uh, the fundamental idea behind meta metaphysics is the ability to learn or adapt by shifting what you're faced with that's new to your own domain that you fully understand. Right? Um, that is the Plutonic way of learning, the idea of the, the Plutonic uh, realm of knowledge, you have to reach the end of it before you take new steps. Right? Um, now, if there are any philosophers among us, I may be butchering that and I may, uh, you may completely disagree and say that that's not at all how you learn something new. You can just drop a pin in the middle of nowhere and that can be new. And that may be true, but I, I'm not here to argue that. I'm here to, to demonstrate how to use this uh, philosophical method in a meaningful way to improve that communicability, to engage uh, multiple consensus algorithms with each other to mitigate that stovepiping, right? So what is meta metaphysics? Um, physics is the study of the physical world. I think we're all on board with that. Metaphysics is how we study the physical world. And oftentimes people call that math. People may argue and say, you know, metaphysics is different from math, but generally speaking, metaphysics and math are, are equated. Um, so we have the study of the physical world and we, we have the study of how we study the physical world, right? How do we uh, identify different systems in the world and, and label the way we study them? So, you know, gravity versus, uh, um, uh, electric charges, and, and if you've taken a lot of physics classes, you may be familiar that flow rates between electrons and flow rates between water and a pipe have a lot of similarities, right? That, that type of understanding of the fundamental math behind those similarities and how they both operate uh, is metaphysics or math, right? Meta metaphysics is a study of how we study the study of the physical world. Um, so that's where things start to get a little abstract. Sometimes this is called meta mathematics. I think metamath is a term that is more informative to what meta metaphysics is. I also think that meta metaphysics is goofy and inherently in being goofy, I work a lot with uh, a lot of people at a lot of different education levels um, in a lot of different contexts from military to state to um, federal. Um, those, that wide variety, uh, it helps to be a little goofy in the language because people may see metamath and say, oh no, I was bad at math. Metamath, I'm out. Like, I'm so far out of here. Um, but they may see meta metaphysics and say, oh, come on, like crystals and stuff, I got this, right? Um, it feels a little more accessible. But at the end of the day, uh, it is accessible, right? 
the way we think about how we organize the world around us is an incredibly human thing to do, right? If I were to ask you, how do you wake up in the morning? Um, you may say, you know, I get up, clean up, get ready, uh, and I go, right? You don't typically taxonomize your utility, right? I, I threw an example, uh, an alarm clock I, I had um, uh, ages ago now. Um, you know, I, I use my, my RC6099 alarm clock to get me out of bed and it plays the local radio station, which is this brand or this station. And I listen to this show and then I get out of bed and I, I my, my bed is, is like raw sheets and I, I brush to Colgate, sometimes Rembrandt. I might use like a shampoo product or, or these types of things. We don't go into that specificity when somebody's like, oh, what'd you do this morning? It's like, you know, I got, a, got out of bed, right? That abstracting from the specificity of each brand of each thing to a general concept is the same thing that meta metaphysics is right, but it's applied to a very human experience as opposed to the more mathematical experience. Um, in one context, that can be really easy in the other, I think it can be a little harder. So what's happening? Like, why is this hard? What's, what's actually going on? When I talk about how I get ready in the morning, um, there, there's a lot of inherent aspects of this system that we might not be thinking of. Um, when I say get up, I could just go from getting up to leaving, right? I don't think most people prefer to do that. I think people like to get ready in the morning, take their time. Um, and when I say I like clean up and rest and grab a bite to eat, you know, I may eat before I, I clean up, I may do the other way around, right? Um, at the end of the day, I go about my day. It's this inherent reasoning. It's this is metaphysical, right? This is a, a diagram where we're in the world of math and we're looking at um, process flow in this regard. Um, but this is just metaphysics, right? We're doing the abstracting in our head. What abstracting are we doing? It's a mapping, right? So when I say I get up in the morning, in my head, I'm imagining my alarm going off. Today, that's my iPhone. I'm not rolling around with a with an uh, old radio at this point, but. I mentally picture, you know, get up in the morning, that alarm is going off. That's what gets me up in the morning, right? When I brush my teeth, when I get ready, I'm using a specific brand of toothpaste. I get the flavor in my head. I think of it I'm like, oh, that's a, the flavor of me getting ready in the morning. That's great. Um, that mapping is going on in my head. And that's what we're trying to do to alleviate a lot of the specificity and a lot of the problems in uh, consensus algorithms, right? So one thing that comes up a lot when I talk about using meta metaphysics for an application like this is, are we ambiguating specificity, right? Are we overcoming specificity by just saying it doesn't matter? Yeah, kind of, but no, um, hold on to that question. And that's a very important question to hold on to, even if you weren't asking it, because I think uh, it informs a lot of the, the later slides and, and hopefully uh, that question makes sense, right? Um, Inherently, we can always take this abstraction and map it to the physical world and to make our, this abstraction useful to turn this theoretical meta math into something we can actually use. We need to map it to the physical world. Otherwise, we're just living in, in a, a mathematical theory, which great, um, worth exploring, but not useful for most people. Right? Um, yeah, I covered that. This is not I'm saying this is not how I plan to, but yeah. Um, the, taxonomic, the taxonomic organization was focused on, um, you know, you, you don't continue to focus on the individual um, brands as you go about your day. That's what that was focusing on. So um, I think I covered this slide incidentally. Yeah, yeah, so I jumped to this slide mentally. Apologies. Um, so how is this done? How do we uh, organize this? And how do we think about this in a more reliable way? Before I get to that, I do want to point you guys to uh, another external resource. So status moment was the first one. Do chairs exist from Vsauce? It's a very fun video. Um, it does a good job at, at explaining this concept, um, but it uses some of the wrong language, which is okay. It's Vsauce. It's informative. Um, they use the phrase ontology as a catch all for this hierarchical mapping or the, the many mapping in the meta metaphysical space which is okay. I think that also lends itself to some of the issues with the phrasing, right? Meta math is intimidating. Meta metaphysics is goofy. Ontology is a little easier, right? Um, one thing that gets to though is other ontologies, right? other meta metaphysical ontologies, especially. Um, some of these are, you may be familiar with, um, semantic web, Wikimedia, um, sticks, and a lot of the owl Purdue work. Um, is anyone, I don't know, show of hands, get some audience engagement going on. Is anyone familiar with any of these um, types of mappings? 
or, or data structures at all? Is anyone not familiar with any of them? I'm trying to make sure I didn't lose everyone. And if I did, I should go back and, and clarify where I lost you. That thumbs down that I lost you. You can type, you can unmute. I'm good with either. Is the thumbs down just that you're not familiar with any of yeah, them? Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, I for, I forget that he has it. Yeah, so um, that's a great example, right? So that is an instance where we're using meta metaphysical ontologies that are non hierarchical, and I'll get to that. Uh, mean, we'll get to what that means in a second, um, to map from one data format to another data format, right? The data format itself is a metaphysical representation of physical data, right? It's a data format. And when we're mapping from one to another, we're identifying which parts are necessary for one to another. Where you get special in this um, for meta metaphysics is that the nature of the mapping itself is a relationship and that's the part that really sticks out as opposed to other ways of organizing data it's not just subset relationship the relationship itself is is a uh, uh, property um and this asks am i understanding correctly that the redundancy and consensus protocols mirrors the idea that because we use different brands of products to prepare ourselves in the morning, our preparation processes are different. Kind of. Um, the way in which we go about looking at something like consensus algorithms is focused on the specificity. Um, this is an algorithm that was built for this purpose to do this thing, right? Bitcoin versus um, uh, the algorithm Bitcoin is actually based on, which was for spam email, right? People don't oftentimes associate the two. Um, it's not so much that our processes are different. In fact, our processes may very well be the same, but because our application and our, in the case of the getting ready in the morning example, our brands are different. We have a hard time in the world of consensus algorithms, seeing them as the same. In the context of getting ready in the morning, because it's something we're so familiar with and routine about that we do do that abstraction ourselves, um, we don't have a problem seeing the similarities in our preparation processes. I think we all imagine we get, to get, we get ready in the morning about the same way. Um, but when you get into consensus realm and you get to where specificity is key, suddenly the fact I use one brand of toothpaste and you may use another becomes really important, right? Does that answer your question, Anis? Cool. Yeah, so let's keep going. So these are not hierarchical ontologies, right? These are mappings from one domain space to another at an equal level, typically. What happens if it's not an equal level? And what happens if we're keenly interested in how to map from one space in particular to another space in particular? Um, there are a lot of methodologies that have been used for this over the years, but the fundamental idea behind them is that the abstract domain space that you're trying to map from, oftentimes referred to as functions, does not necessarily have a direct relationship with the map space you're trying to map to, the physical world, right? So this theoretical function in the physical world, they may have a relationship. Um, if they do, why are you using this thinking, right? Um, more frequently though, there is an emergent behavior in the physical world uh, and there's an expected behavior of your theoretical functions and it's through those emergent and expected behaviors that you're able to actually connect the two, right? Um, why does this matter? Um, this matters because that's, that's what I'm about to explain, but it also matters because that's where the specificity comes in, right? It's the expected behavior from our theoretical ideas coupled with the emergent behavior from the physical world that connects the two right and that's where the specificity of the physical world and all of the nuances of how colgate toothpaste does something different from rembrandt toothpaste and one may or may not be more or less toxic to one type of individual than the other um, comes into play right that's that emergent behavior right? toxicity those types of things that's the emergent behavior and how that maps to the expected behavior we have for the theoretical functions is the importance of this process right um so you can let go of that idea now um and probably weren't even holding it anyway but worth a shot uh, but that's the general idea we could in, in many instances map the theoretical world to the physical world 
And if that is the only thing we can do, don't do this, don't, don't apply this. But if we can't, then this is the methodology. This is one of many methodologies, but a key methodology that you may use to remedy that issue. Fundamentally, I like the function behavior structure methodology. Is it safe to say you can just roll whichever methodology you like the most and adjust it as you see fit? As long as you're sticking to the fundamentals of defining function and structure have a relationship through behavior, uh, meta-metaphysics would argue absolutely, right? Um, you, of course, need to have some definition of the interplay between the layers of your analysis, right? So um, in our case, I'll get to it in a second, um, each proper, each sub-element from the physical world to the theoretical world is sufficient to prove the existence of the next one, right? That's what the linkages are. Um, but depending on your application, that may be very different. Um, another application space I've applied this to is in infrastructure. And that's about composability, but there's a necessary composability in that. This functionality, I think, is, is really useful for a couple reasons. Um, this uh, methodology, sorry, is useful for a couple reasons. Function behavior structure was uh, one of the few meta-metaphysical methodologies developed at a robust scale um, that was done so under a tight time crunch. Um, I'm a pretty big believer that tight time crunches lead to more useful results a lot of the time. Um, even if they're not more effective, but in this case, I, I think both were achieved. Um, in light of the dot-com boom, a lot of companies needed to uh, digitize a lot of their infrastructure that they hadn't considered digitizing before. Um, so to do that, they to looked at their company functions, they looked at the expected behavior of those functions, they identified which assets were currently doing those behaviors, and then they abstracted away the emergent behavior of those assets. Then, of course, methodologically, they went back and they started to find which of those assets they could replace with digital ones to do the same emergent behavior, and that produced design documents that allowed those companies to modernize. This was a very common business practice back then. Um, by adopting that for what we're doing now, we can, we can take advantage of how streamlined that process flow is, and we don't have to go ahead and start replacing those structural elements. As long as we get that initial structure, that's all we need. Um, and this is something I've, I've used in other fields, and it's worked really well, and, and I think it works really well here as well. Um, it's just a way of organizing behavioral thinking, um, not human behavioral, but system behavioral. Uh, so what are we mapping between? Um, in our case, uh, so I've got FBS, I've got R layer, and I'll, I'll label that more properly in a couple slides. Um, but the function to expect behavior, to emergent behavior, to structure, we're going property, to sub-property, to system element. And we're not including the structure. It's not that we're not including it in our work. We're including it in our work, but we will defer to it to help us build the system elements, but we're not looking to replace it eventually. So including it in our analysis and the overall structure of what we're building isn't so important. Um, and before I explain the methodology, does anyone have any questions on uh, the problems in distributed systems or um, how to think metaphysically um, at a cursory level? If there are deeper questions, I definitely have time for those. I think I'm two minutes ahead of schedule on this. So, um, yeah, any questions anyone has, any thoughts, anyone wants to express comments. Don't take jeering tomato throws as well, those are fine. All right. So, um, what good is a methodology if you don't have an audience, right? So who is this methodology for? Um, it's for analysts and authors. Um, analysts are people who look at consensus algorithms, try to understand and why they work, how they work, whether they're the same or different from other ones. And authors try to look at existing algorithms and demonstrate why their algorithms are new or novel in some key way. Okay. So a lot of bullet points on here, but effectively this uh, methodology needs to be scalable, needs to be extensible, it needs to be repeatable, um, and it needs to be able to handle nuance both in um, the existing state of the art, but also in the introduction of new state of the art. So what is this methodology? So cut out everything else, just straight to the facts. Uh, four steps, right? So you define your necessary focal point of the system. In our case, for uh, consensus algorithms, we're looking at termination, validity, and agreement. Um, termination, validity, and agreement is the current state of the art for the expected security properties to be proven to guarantee system correctness. It has not been the only state of the art for that. That's changed over the years. Integrity was a key part of that. Was that Many points, we now assume away integrity into the behavior of the network. Um, 
people who use this methodology may want to add that back in. You may have more than one requirement, right? So you may have not just system correctness, but you may have other ones, but for the sake of this methodology and this work, we're focusing on correctness. So you identify and define those fundamental properties you're interested in. In our case, termination, the idea that the system will halt uh, validity, the idea that the system will uh, be valid and agreement, uh, the idea that the system will be consistent when it halts. You then outline the sub-properties for those properties. Uh, so for termination, how do we expect that to occur? Let's define the actual ways in which we expect termination to occur. For validity and agreement, we do the same thing. Then we identify which elements in the algorithm itself do those things. How does it halt? How does it uh, reach a decision? Um, and we can defer to the existing proofs that are in existing papers to find that. Um, if the paper was done well, hopefully that's there. Um, if the paper is a little older or proved to different standards, we may have to do some finagling. Then we will look at how those feed in to our expected behavior, label those as system elements or emergent behaviors of those systems, and use that to, inf to refine our sub-properties until we're able to properly capture the way in which the properties are fulfilled within the algorithms we're looking at. We can apply this for one algorithm, we can apply it to many, um, and, and both are okay. So in practice, what does this look like? I talked about termination, validity, and agreement, but we may achieve that with these uh, sub-properties identified and labeled here. Um, I won't spend too much time on, on this because I think I'm gonna spend a little more time on it uh, the next slide, if I can slow down or scroll down and see, yeah. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll then look at, uh, no, I actually wanna slow down, I apologize. Um, yeah, so if you look at this termination, right? So the idea that uh, eventually each process will decide a value. Um, we guarantee that each process can receive a transaction. We guarantee they can order it and uh, we finalize the decision on it. Right? If we can prove those sub properties, we can prove the termination happens. Validity has a similar structure um, with its properties as well. And agreement, of course, that's the nice continuity of this is that they are similar. Um, what happens if we get to a point where we're looking at these uh, emergent elements from the system, the emergent system elements, and we haven't completed one of the sub-properties, right? The papers we're looking at don't have in their proofs necessary ways of proving our sub-properties. This is okay, this happens. Um, there's a couple ways you can address this, all of which are, are okay, depending on the analysis and the authoring that you're doing. Why are you doing this analysis? Why are you using this methodology? We'll determine naturally, um, which of these you do. Effectively though, you may not have properly defined a sub-property. That sub-property may not need to exist. Um, that's always an option. The sub-property that you've identified that's necessary to proving the property, um, assuming it does need to exist, may be found in the system design assumptions or they may just be inherent as part of the um, system itself. Uh, so this happens in one of the uh, algorithms we look at, and I, I have that a few slides later, um, but a good example is um, uh, a lot of the assumed correctness of correct processes in consensus algorithms. So correct processes are assumed to be correct, um, and that covers a lot of your fundamental proofs in that regard. In some systems, that's not the case, right? So you start looking at things like um, cryptocurrency miners where they have incentive to behave correctly, uh, then you start to look at times where that may be more detailed, but in this case, not so much. Um, it may also be the case that it's not proven in this paper. You know, the paper you're currently looking at does not have a sufficient proof for that sub-property which needs to be there. That's an analytic result. Uh, you may have found something that the paper isn't capable of doing, and that may be worth reporting or they just don't capture how they're capable of doing it. In any case, if you don't remove it, if you don't remove the sub-property and you don't have sufficient elements to be able to generate uh, emergent system elements, or uh, you don't have sufficient um, content and components in the paper to develop those emergent system elements, you can do a generic one. Right? Um, a generic proof typically involves the existence of the elements you need for the proof, definitions for those elements, and the ability for those elements to adhere to those definitions. That's a typically fundamental proof for a lot of system element things. Um, is it great? No. Is it a stand-in until you refer to more papers that have more elements? Yes, absolutely. Is it usable? 100%.
Here's a sample output for termination validity and agreement to give us that ontological structure to map from the property domain all the way to the physical domain. Um, what does this look like uh, in, in practice? Um, you can demonstrate that existing proofs are able to prove these sub properties and these system elements. Um, but if you don't necessarily need all the system elements to be proven, you can abstract some of it away, right? So maybe in one uh, comparison of algorithms, we're interested especially on the validity property, right? We can abstractly prove that they both suffice to prove termination, but the way in which they prove validity is different, and that's what we're interested in. Um, we can prove to the individual system elements how each one proves it and where they prove it differently. We can highlight that as a, as a distinction between the two um, algorithms and say, you know, that's where the, the difference between these algorithms really lies. Um, if you just want to prove that both of them are correct, you can just stick to what people have been doing for a while, right? Just prove to the top layer, termination, validity, and agreement. Don't get into the nitty gritties. Um, the point of this methodology to develop this um, ontology is that that scalability is available to you, right? Um, by doing so, you can over-specify where certain properties and, and certain uh, proofs are able to develop um, their uniqueness, or you can just accept that they're all proven correctly. Um, and I think that's a, a level of communicability and a level of use that a lot of attempts at standards fails at. Um, great, I accidentally spoke ahead of my slides. Um, the beauty of this, though, is that we don't have to reprove everything, and we get a common language um, to be able to talk about the, the differences and the sameness in these consensus algorithms without the need for a standard. Um, now, when you're looking at two different uh, algorithms in two different domains, robotics versus um, cryptocurrency, if you're able to prove them to the same hierarchical ontological structure that you may have derived from looking at both of them, then one thing you can do with that hierarchical structure is um, map them, right? <laughs> so where this proof, <laughs> sorry, proves to the base level elements of, uh, give me just a second, I apologize. I mute myself. Not as over that cold as I want it to be. Huh? Um, you can map them both to the same structure, right? So you develop that structure based on both the algorithms and where one completes the structure and the other one doesn't or vice versa. Um, you may be able to identify uh, the differences or the sameness in those. Um, and if you find that one proof is able to prove to the system elements of the, of the ontology and the other one, the other paper, you're having trouble proving to the system elements of that ontology and you can only prove to the um, emergent behaviors, then you may need to refine your structure. Um, or you may be able to just prove the first paper to the uh, emergent behavior. So I'm just using my hands right now, maybe a little more specific. So let's say in some papers, uh, one of the two papers you can prove to the red, um, the other paper you only prove to the blue. Um, you may want to just rescale your proof from the red to the blue and identify where there are differences. If at that level they look the same, uh, and you know or you are inclined to believe that they're different and you'd like to conduct that analysis, of course, you could leave it and say, you know, at this level, they're the same. But if you'd like to go a little deeper, reframing your um, emergent elements in this proof so that you can identify those differences clearly uh, is the next step. If you do that and you find that they're still the same, I have bad news for you, they're still the same. Um, that hasn't changed. You can't uh, uh, overdo um, uh, what you've found in that regard. Uh, small detour on this, um, PBFT's problem. So PBFT, if uh, some of you guys are or are not familiar with PBFT, is the Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance, uh, OSDI uh, 1999 um, at MIT, uh, the first Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerant distributed computing algorithm. It has a flaw. It has a flaw that depending on the consensus conference you go to or the distributed systems conference you go to, people are more or less willing to acknowledge. Um, the flaw that it has is based in its synchrony conditions. So it believe, or it uh, bases its synchrony conditions on being in a partially synchronous environment. Um, and in an asynchronous environment, what it gets into is a position where the leader keeps cycling and it's not actually able to produce any results. Um, this can be really hard to prove in the original portrayal of PBFT. 
um, PBFT in its original form is only proved to safety and liveness. Um, so in our paper, in the Hopska paper, um, so it's a hierarchical, hierarchically ontological proof structure for consensus algorithms. I didn't read it when it was at the top of the slide here. Um, we actually proved to the elements of termination where that inherent reliance on the system uh, assumption of partial synchrony comes into play, and it exposes pretty clearly that checkpointing may or may not occur. And if the checkpointing may or may not occur, that's where you actually run into this issue. Um, does this expose something novel that we've never seen before? No. Um, part of the reason we're able to expose this is because one of the algorithms that uh, we're referring to in developing this ontology actually solves this problem. Right? But, what, but because of that, we're able to show the distinction right? in the algorithm that solves this problem and the algorithm that doesn't solve this problem. It's clear in the algorithm that doesn't solve this problem that that problem is not solved. Um, so this is a type of thing that increases communicability and uh, frames how you work and uh, uh, explore existing algorithms, but it doesn't necessarily expose inherent weaknesses that you don't already know about. Right? And that's what I was getting to um, on the last slide that I was trying to hone in on. Right? If, if they look the same to you, that the best of your knowledge, they're the same. That's what this is. It's about communicability. It's about organizational structure. It's about showing the differences between algorithms. It's not about, you know, um, conducting an, a novel methodology, right? There are things that formal methods will do that, that this just will not do. So some key takeaways. Um, if, if, again, to, if you tuned out at the beginning, you're tuning back in now, or you're one of the three people I think who left, um, came back and read this, this is important, right? So meta metaphysical ontologies can be applied in this domain to improve to improve the efficacy of uh, communication. Right? Um, in theory, you could take this to create a unified standard. No, thank you. Um, a unified standard is not required to use this methodology. Um, and so I say no, thank you, not because I wouldn't like a unified standard, but because I'm firmly of the belief that any unified standard is a, a couple of weeks away from starting to get disunified. Um, and uh, most importantly, by thinking in this way and organizing your structure in this way, both from an author perspective where you're defining your algorithm in the first place, um, and from an analytic perspective where you're using this structure to help you analyze the algorithms, um, you're able to uh, communicate clearly and effectively the uniqueness of each algorithm, right, and without the need for a standard. And that's the important part of this. Uh, I have this paper section in the paper. I think it's important, especially as this is a more philosophically oriented field. Uh, I think it's important to take a small discussion into what we did or didn't do that we could have done. Right? Um, yeah, so one thing we tried to do that um, seemed obvious at the time and really wasn't. Um, if you look at the, the structure, especially um, on this earlier slide, here, you'll see there's an R. That's the requirement starting point. It's how you identify your functions. For us, the R is um, correctness, right? We want system correctness, and to do that, we have three sub-properties we're currently proving to. In one of our instances of working on this, um, we tried to move those properties of termination, validity, and agreement into requirements. Um, fundamentally, that's saying the wrong thing, right? It's saying that we require a system to terminate, be valid, and agree. Um, we require it to be correct. The way it's correct, we have expectations about and functions that we, we need to see. Um, but by doing that, you get at two issues. One, what if those uh, fundamental definitions of correctness change over time? Right? That can certainly happen, and it did. And integrity used to be part of this and isn't anymore. So that creates a, a set of structures that are harder to adopt over time. Are they incommunicable with the structures that we ended up creating? Not at all. Right? You end up doing a layer shift and mapping in that regard, and that's okay. Um, also, though, it's three times as large as ours. It would be like 150 lines instead of uh, this pretty concise and neat structure. And so that's, that's pretty important. We also considered including a structural layer. You might have noticed on that that we don't. And I explained why we don't, because it's changes from paper to paper. And we didn't want to include that level of specificity in the resulting uh, tree. Um, we did start with that level of specificity, though. Uh, and so here's a tear away from what that looked like. And you can see it gets very mathy very quickly. Um, it causes a path explosion issue, though, and that hinders usability, which we don't want to do. Um, and finally, two others. We considered both a requirement for safety and a requirement for liveness instead of just a requirement for correctness. That's something you can totally do as you uh, implement this if you choose to take this methodology or a methodology like this and go forward. Adding more requirements like that doesn't change 
um, the, fun the fundamentals of what you're doing. The reason why we didn't is, uh, again, cumbersome usability. Um, proving correctness as a whole is sufficient, so we stuck to that. Um, we also considered creating a unified ontology. You know, uh, it could be used to create a standard, so why not do it? I'm just not within the scope of the paper, nor within our wherewithal to suggest that we've reviewed enough papers to be able to actually do that. So, any questions? Comments, concerns, thoughts, feelings, emotions? I'll take them all. Hey Cyrus, thanks for the nice presentation. I the the way you've presented the ontology, especially towards the end, it makes me feel like somebody else could sit down and do this, do something similar, and then you'd have two competing ontologies, and then maybe from there you'd have three competing ontologies. You mentioned fifteen competing ontologies. Does this actually avoid the problems with standards? I think so. So the reason I think so is because if you are structuring from the from from a property down to a um, system element, right? So you're keeping the same mapping from property to system element, from property to system element. Even if you take a different methodology that also takes a meta metaphysical approach to go from proof properties to algorithm, right? Um, there is inherently a, a hierarchy that you've created in there. And that hierarchy allows you to uh, map from one to the other. Will it require another grouping to do that mapping? 100%, right? So if, if you want to take those 15 ontologies and, and merge them together, that would, into a single ontology, you could do that and it would require it, right? Um, but I can look at my ontology and I can look at your ontology and I can say, hey, that branch, that's different than that branch. And that branch is kind of those two branches put together. It's that comparability that improves communication, right? And so we're not necessarily hoping that um, the structure that you create will be ubiquitous at any given time. Um, but we are hoping that the structure that you create will be communicable with the structure someone else creates. So if I understand correctly, you're saying that ontologies resist this kind of uh, competitive duplication because they're composable. So you just build a tree together if somebody else makes their own ontology. Yep. Oh, that's a big benefit. All right, thanks. You phrased it better than I have, so I'm going to try to include that in my paper somewhere. Um, uh, Dr. Sherman asked me to... Uh, and explain how this fits into the dissertation that I'm trying to wrap up. <laughs> this fits into my dissertation in a kind of uh, funny way. So my original intent for my dissertation was to create a standardized ontology for all of these proofs. Um, yay. Uh, hubris uh, was really taking over when I proposed that, I think. Um, the way I planned to do that was originally to design a bunch of hybrid algorithms that are hybrid synchrony, um, hybrid permissions. So we talked about permission, permissionless with regard to state, um, and hybrid agreement. So crash fault tolerant and Byzantine fault tolerant systems working together. Um, those are hard problems to solve. And I created templates for solving them and how to address them, but the implementation is a huge barrier. Not only is the implementation a huge barrier, but proving things are consistent uh, and are able to behave the same way uh, in hybrid environments is hard. Um, and one of the biggest obstacles to that is proving that the two algorithms are even remotely similar. So in trying to do that work to be able to create a foundation for how to communicate between my different proofs, uh, I required a foundation for how to communicate between the different proofs of the algorithms that I was working on, um, which kicked off this paper. Uh, so this paper ended up being a basis for how I can actually demonstrate that when I create a hybrid environment that allows a partially synchronous and an asynchronous uh, protocol to be used interchangeably, um, I have to be able to demonstrate certain key characteristics that they have. This uh, work helps me do that in a communicable way that allows me to be able to actually demonstrate that going forward and incorporate the algorithms into a larger algorithm that can take advantage of synchronous conditions when available. And I don't know, uh, Sherman, if I actually told you that, but. Thanks. Um, as you know, in the UMBC protocol analysis lab, we are doing a lot of research in trying to eliminate the possibility of adverse protocol interactions like man in the middle. It, it seems to me that, that there's a strong connection between the idea of certain properties of distributed algorithms, including consensus and, and the sort of things we're thinking about. I, I, I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts about like how consensus 
in your world uh, might relate to the idea of um, injective agreement of values in, in the context of protocol analysis? Yeah, um, uh, the way you phrase that last part, a lot of things come to mind. Um, at first, uh, I, I was going to talk about the fact that I've been um, trying my best to uh, uh, develop a way of demonstrating um, the correctness of PBFT in CPSA. Um, so one thing that you get advantageously from thinking about properties uh, as representative of systems is the idea that if a bunch of systems in a distributed system are behaving similarly, they are effectively one system because they have the same intent, they have the same behaviors. You could represent them as a single peer in a peer to peer transaction. And, and I think I'll be able to wrap that up pretty easily. Um, just some hiccups with CPSA that I'm bumping into right now. Um, but what you bring up as well is um, the uh, inherent foundation for ground truth that you may get in a consensus algorithm, right? So something that um, Hyben and CC proposed a long time ago to the Department of Homeland Security, CISA division. Um, they were looking at proposing a formal way of defining decentralized central authorities. Um, and of course the reaction at that time, 2018, 2019, was you can't have decentralized centralization. Um, and the idea there uh, at its core being, you know, if we all together recognize that this one entity has this knowledge, um, then we all together can recognize that they are that that knowledge, right? Um, and if they have private keys, public keys, you can you can imbue them with the uh, um, uh, identity that they have, right? So that's a that's a decentralized identity where the peers are all able to recognize that that is here. Um, that creates a, a better foundation for zero trust in the long term from an infrastructural perspective, but also in the realm of um, peer to peer communication. Uh, when you're looking to establish, you know, what which parties know what information and how do you verify their identities, then you're able to do that without relying on central authorities, which can be spoofed. Right. So that man in the middle for identity spoofing um, becomes a lot harder to do. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Are there any more questions? So with that, um, thank you very much, Cyrus. Thank you. And this concludes concludes today's session. <clears throat>